up standing, please worship the mayor. Nos waitab paub kroisio. Before we start, bear with me on this one. Bloidin Nuida. Happy New Year, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to this evening's meeting. Please note this meeting will be recorded for subsequent broadcast via the authority's internet site. Images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. The public seating areas will be in view of the camera. And by entering the chamber and using the public seating area, members of the public are consenting to be filmed and to, and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings as outlined above. So the first item on the agenda this evening is apologies for absence. We have apologies from Councillor Ernie Goldsworthy and I think we've assumed apologies from Councillor Howard Bath. Ms. May also uh, apologies from Councillor David Jones. Thank you all. Um, next item is declarations of interest. Members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government of Finance Act 1992 relating to Council Tax, Local Government Act 2000, the Council Constitution and the Members Code of Conduct. Do we have any declarations of interest? Mr. Mayor. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> declaration of uh, prejudicial interest on agenda item seven, Biff of Profit Sharing Scheme. Um, I'm actually the Secretary and Committee Member of Ganlacher and Pendaran Community Association, so I'll uh, declare my interest in the item and, and leave at the time. Okay, thank you, Chris. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, declaration for. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't started my treatment yet, so um, I am able to, to be here this evening. So uh, um, anyway, I've uh, uh, declared my interest in item four. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and it's good to see you here too this evening. Anything else? Any other? No? And the next item on the agenda, minutes of the previous meetings. To approve as accurate the minutes of the following meetings, 3A through to 3J. Are there any questions? No. Can we have a move on that, please? I move the motion. I second it. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Can we put that straight to the vote then, please? <coughs> Thank you, everyone. That motion is carried. And the next item on the agenda is dispensation for extended absence. Councillor Paul Brown, consider the report of the Chief Ex Executive, pages 45 to 46. Very glad to be here. And I understand Councillor Andrew Barry is uh, taking this one. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, unusual situation. I think Paul's here. But um, it's just to grant um, dispensation for Paul when he does start his treatment. Uh, straight to the recommendation, which is uh, Paul Brown's grant of dispensation uh, for extended absence for more meetings in his role as Councillor of the Cabal for the Electoral Division uh, to an including 30th of May. I second that. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Any comments? No? Can we put that to the vote then, please? Thank you, that vote's been carried. Um, the next item on the agenda is agenda item number five. <coughs> next.
next item on the agenda is agenda item number five, the council tax, council tax reduction scheme, 2018 to 2019, to consider report of the deputy chief executive, and that can be found on pages 47 through to 50. And I understand Councillor Andrew Barry is taking this one forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, an annual report that comes to us, council tax reduction scheme 1819. Um, I'm sure everybody's been through the report. Um, the recommendation is simply the council tax reduction scheme be adopted uh, for 1718 and readopted for 1819 financial year commencing for, for 1819. I second that motion. Thank you. And do we have any questions? No? Any comments? Councillor Jones. Um, I've got a comment. Um, have spoken to the officer who has written the report because I was pretty well taken aback at the figure on page 48, the very bottom figure in the right hand side, the cost of the authority has gone up to £219,156 and I spoke to you Elizabeth French this afternoon, the figure is correct um, and I need to confirm that um, Steve Jones and the accountants have had to take that figure, uh, which is obviously quite substantial, into account for um, the current stance of the year on next year. Thank you, Clive. Any other comments? No? Can we put that to the vote then, please? All that vote is carried. Um, next item on the agenda is agenda item number six, primary school competition for design of Shumairament logo. To consider the report of the Deputy Chief Executive, pages 51 to 54. I understand Councillor Mitten's taking this one. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, just a little bit of background. As you know, um, uh, we have to ensure that we have a strategy in place to meet the um, Welsh language measures 2011. This council agreed that five-year strategy back in November 2017. Um, and in line with our strategy, it obviously sets out a vision for Merthyr Tydfil where bilingualism is normalised and um, people are used to hearing and seeing Welsh when they're out and about in the county borough. Um, we tend to use the term incidental Welsh, if you like, so hopefully people will um, say things like Borida, um, Shamai, etc. And one way that we want to encourage that is by gaining the support of our schools as well. And this report is basically to um, create a Shamairament uh, environment in Merthyr Tydfil, where they're happy to use Welsh words and phrases with each other to cre create sorry, a unique bilingual environment. Um, not that it'll be forced upon our residents, um, but hopefully encouraged. And as part of that, um, in order to fully adopt, promote and embed the Shamairament culture across the county borough, the primary schools in Merthyr Tydfil will be entering a competition to design a logo. And so the recommendation in this report is that Council's proposed arrangements for the primary school competition to design a logo for Shamairament be approved. Do we have a seconder? Thank you. Do we have any questions? Clive. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can I take you to the executive summary on page 54 of the report and the, and the paragraph which is headed background and the second paragraph down, the second sentence, which reads, just for over 100 years ago, 90% of the population here spoke Welsh. Can I ask um, any of the, uh, either cabinet member or the, or the officer, where that figure was sourced from, please? Um, that, the, the figure that, that's quoted in there, uh, came from the, the piece of work that was carried out by our uh, Welsh officer uh, within the local authority. In terms of where the actual figure itself came from, I, I'd have to come back to you on that. Sorry, Councillor. I think he came from census figures going back, obviously, that that, that, uh, pe that period in time. So there's been a trend from 
to the highest proportion of people in Merthyr speaking Welsh and actually climbing as more and more people move into the area and then it's, it's gradually changed to more and more uh, English being spoken over that time. Well, I researched it, uh, Mr Chairman, and uh, it is a question. Um, and I've got it in front of me. The 1911 census states that the Merthyr County Borough, the, po the number of people who spoke Welsh was 50.2%. Um, the word Thorpe, uh, that needs correcting. Yeah, Councillor, I think that it's absolutely right that we should get exactly the right figures in there. Um, but of course, you would be appreciative of the political climate at the time and the, the time of the Welsh not. And so people wouldn't feel declaring when they spoke Welsh a great deal of the time in any event. So you're right, we must get the accurate figure. But it's also important, I think, to remember the climate that there was at the time, which may have helped to influence those figures. Certainly the impression at that time was that there were a lot of people who spoke Welsh in, in this area. Okay, do you, have any, do you have any other questions on that? No, um, any comments? Christopher, Councillor Christopher. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Um Just like to thank the officers really who put um, the work into preparing this report and obviously the work that goes on behind the scenes in terms of engaging with schools and cascading the, the message. I'm quite excited, as I'm sure Councillor Thomas is, um, Scott Thomas, who came up with the slogans from my moment, um, that we can engage with our children and, and, and be proud and celebrating the, the, the Welsh language and just the use of incidental Welsh that's used across the, the county borough. Um, and just want to say that I'm looking forward to the responses that come back from schools. We've got something then alongside uh, you know, very vibrant and you know, very historic logo that we can use to promote the, the Welsh language in the borough and to promote the strategy uh, and show how proud we are in Merthyr of, you know, our roots, um, you know, as the Montreal officers just said, probably Councillor Jones is right to say the accurate figures, but probably the anecdotal figures is, I think, how the language officer in the spirit of what, you know, he was trying to um, present is that, you know, this would have been a, a very strong base of Welsh language and Welsh language speaking in terms of in the churches and chapels that would have um, you know been a, f a very strong focal point for the community to come together but I just um, you know thank the officers for this and we look forward to um, after half term now and St David's Day where we can get together and we can launch this and uh, and celebrate really the historic links we've got to Welsh language but be proud of moving forward in terms of promoting Welsh language here in Merthyr Tidville. Diolch well, Chris, Clive. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, um, I take into account uh, what the monitoring officer has said, but nevertheless, if we are writing a report, and I check not only on the 1911 census, but the census before that and the census afterwards, and the, the figures referring to Welsh are, were on a decline, and that was part of it. The figure, frankly, jumped up at me. 90% uh, plus, I mean, take into account the fact that there was a lot of um, people who came here from Spain, Ireland, England, etc. And part of my family um, background was that they came from, from England. So I think, you know, we need to be very careful when we put figures in like that. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Rogers. Can you be my company? I support the venture, yeah, but uh, I'm always a little bit wary, and I support the Welsh language 100%. But uh, I can even remember, I don't even ask, I remember when we had our own disturbance in Merthyr Tidwell. In Uber, it's regular every year. I used to go with my aunt and my brother and him, and compete and myself as a boy soprano as well. Like. So. <laughs> you were a boy soprano? I was, yes, I was a boy soprano, my brother. I won it. Um, what I would say is that I don't, what I am afraid of, and I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I don't want the elitism to come into it because you can't speak Welsh. Now, I find that in a lot of areas, especially going to different parts of Wales, but uh, I hope it doesn't happen in Merthyr Tidbill or, or anywhere in the valleys, and I use Shumai every day. It's part of my everyday language. But I support the venture, but we must remember that uh, people who uh, can't speak Welsh are also must be treated properly as a well who are fluent in Welsh. Thank you, Councillor Rogers. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. J just, just in conclusion, I hope, um, I just want to remind colleagues that we did pass the Welsh Language Strategy back in November, and this isn't about the Welsh Language Strategy per se. This is about children, uh, encouraging children to actually produce a logo, and it doesn't matter what walk of life they come from or what language they speak. It is about encouraging incidental Welsh, and it is about encouraging them to take part and produce a logo, a design for Shumaira Ment to encourage everybody. And let's hope the 48% that's a little skewed at the moment now take on some incidental Welsh as well. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Lisa. And can we take that to the vote then, please? Thank you very much, all. That's, uh, th that vote's been carried. Um, next item on the agenda is number item number seven is the Biffa Community Awards to consider the report of the Chief Officer Community Regeneration. You can find that on pages 55 through to 60. And this time, <coughs> Councillor Geraint Thomas taking this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, summary of the report uh, to seek the Council's instructions on the allocation of funds from the Penn Darren Electoral Division. Um, the recommendations are a councillor for the electoral division has declared an interest and under the council's constitution where such an occurrence happens then it is necessary for the whole council to confirm or otherwise the allocation of these funds. So moved. Councillor, can you propose um, a positive recommendation, do you think? Do you have a recommendation to council as to whether they approve the fund or otherwise? Yes, uh, we do approve the fund, yeah. I second that motion. Thank you. Do we have any questions? No? Any comments? No? Um, can we put that to the vote then, please? Thank you, everyone. That motion has been carried. everyone next item on the agenda is a closed section which is exempt uh, so in order that the following items can be dis considered in private it is suggested that the public be excluded from the meeting on the grounds that involve likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 14 15 and part 4 of schedule a of section 100 a 4 of the local government act 1972 Councillor Mitten. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can we move to section 106, please? Just on that item. Oh, there's nobody in the public gallery. S section 100. Oh, sorry, section 100. Now, just checking there's nobody in the gallery. I second the motion, yep. Thank you, Julian. Uh. Sorry, I just got a, a question. Actually, um, <coughs> I'd like to know why it's felt that this needs to be a section one hundred because there's no contractual information in there. There's no one is named in there, and there's nobody's conditions of service in there. It's to me this should be an open report. I'm always a bit reluctant to um, move section one hundred, which means that. Um, we are in, in effect discuss things and uh, debate things in, in secret behind closed doors. So I just like to know why it's felt that this has got to be uh, a section 100 item. I'm not necessarily saying no, but I'd just like some detail on it. I, I think, th um, unless anybody else wants to deal with that point, that the answer is that even though you haven't, haven't got members of staff named, because their role is defined, you can identify the member of staff um, from the report. And the, the purpose of having it as an exempt item is that we would be discussing something which would be in the public domain before the member of staff concerned might have been consulted about it. The well, only response I've got to that is that uh, the officer, I think if I, if I heard him correctly, um, when we discussed these matters before, 
he said that the trade unions had been consulted on this, and, and as the trade unions represent <coughs> the uh, staff involved, I wouldn't have thought that again justifies uh, us discussing things uh, behind closed doors. Again, that's just just a, just a question. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think the issue uh, clearly is, as as, uh, as Caris has outlined, uh, we, we 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 consult with the union as good uh, trade union and employer practice. So therefore, whilst they're aware of it, the members of staff are not. So the principle of uh, the reconfiguration of any service will be discussed with the unions because that assists us through the process. The point Caris has said is because these papers, if they were made public, would have been made public last Thursday, all of a sudden, uh, if you're interested in council business, you read the agenda and all of a sudden you find yourself that you may be at risk. Um, so the issue is, is that there's no decision made until such time as this council makes a decision. Uh, so why put that member of staff through that, uh, uh, through that uh, process? Uh, if you make that decision to accept these reports, then clearly the next stage, and I believe it's in business cases, there will be a discussion with the members of staff tomorrow uh, and those individuals. So it's, it's protecting those members of staff and it also protects this authority. Clearly leaking it into, uh, putting it into the public domain, actually, uh, you know, it actually usurps the powers under the Local Government Act uh, 1972, the uh, exempt provisions. So uh, I understand what Councillor Amos has said, um, but they are exempt and the matters then will be discussed uh, with the staff members concerned uh, in due course. Councillor Rogers. Uh, uh, I, I take uh, Chief Executive's comments in time, and it seems sensible enough to me, but don't we, shouldn't we consult with people before we do things? Because the proper way of the, of the trade union, I was weaned on the trade union, that's my background, shouldn't we start consulting with people before we, I mean, you can't, you can't be spot on, but somebody should be made aware. So what we're going to do tonight, really, is if I'm wrong, please correct me, Gareth. If I'm wrong tonight, we're going to make a decision or not, then the people are going to be informed tomorrow or day after whatever. That's what we would. Now, I thought that if these people, wherever they are, whatever their department, they should have been consulted before it comes to council because the council is the definitive answer. This is the last one. Once the council decides, that's it tomorrow. That's what you're going to be and what you're going to do. So I, I'm a little bit worried about this now, really. We should be consulting more and talking with people. We can't be deliberate about it, Gareth, you understand me? Because we don't really know yet, like. So I'm a little bit concerned about that, really. Yeah. I know Mark may want to deal with it. The, the, the issue is, is what we, the council's already issued a section 188 letter in regards to its potential number of redundancies in this authority. That's done in, on the basis of protecting this authority, which is what is required. Um, the business cases will come forward um, in regards to what uh, this authority wishes to do, because clearly in the current budgetary situation, we need to slim down the business, become more efficient, more effective, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those decisions are uh, ultimately obviously brought before the cabinet. The cabinet makes a decision of whether it should come back forward uh, before the, the council. Uh, this council's made a decision previously when considering that, that they should be referred to scrutiny and audit, which they've uh, been duly done and gone through that process. Clearly, what we don't want to do is put members of staff, whether it's a small member of staff or a large member of staff, uh, on notice that they could possibly be made redundant. Now, the issue is in regards to these, when we discuss them, there's a reassurance that some members of st uh, all staff can be redeployed if they wish to be redeployed. So there's not a compulsory redundancy scenario. The discussion we have with the trade unions who look after the welfare of those members who are trade union representatives, and I've got to say only 50% of this authority's staff are trade union members, 50% are not. So therefore, uh, clearly, you know, the unions don't look after the non-members. Uh, but it's a matter for this council. If this council takes the decision that in order to do look at business re-engineering, business efficiency, that we need to go down this line, then rather than raise the issue with members of staff and put them at areas of concern straight off, if this council didn't uh, accept that, which it's entitled to do, then all of a sudden we've raised the expectations of these staff, put them in an uncertain position, 
uh, and, and all of a sudden we go back to them and say, well, actually, not going to be made. Uh, there's no issues there now. So the issue is, um, I hear what you say, uh, Tony. You know, we've done, we've <coughs> consulted with the unions. They know the position uh, we're in. They've accepted the process we've adopted. It's been a long and established process. This isn't new. Uh, we've do, been doing it over the last five, six, seven years. Uh, if the decision is made tonight, then the discussion will be ongoing with the staff members. That's when the uh, the, the necessary, whether I don't know whether it's 45 days now or or whatever, that that process uh, that process will come into being, uh, and ultimately, uh, the, you know, s staff will be redeployed or they'll take take leave. Three words. Can I accept that? That's okay. That's a answer that I was uh, worried about. Thank you, uh, Dara. Thank you. Do we have any other, other questions? Any comments? No. Can we take and this this vote is purely to go for the <laughs> section one hundred. <laughs> so you're just voting on the section one hundred now, not the one oh six. Okay, can we put that to the vote then, please? Thank you, everyone. That vote is carried. Number 13, to deal with any other urgent business or correspondence, I have none. And item number 14, to receive communications from His Worship the Mayor, I have none. So I'd just like to say, Jochen Raub and Nostar.